Hello and welcome to a special edition of Represent NYC. I'm Dr. Christina Greer. Voters in 14 states turned out this week on Super Tuesday to pick their favorite presidential candidates. It's the single biggest day of voting in the primary season, awarding about a third of the delegates up for grabs. This was the Super Tuesday that no one predicted. Vice President Joe Biden won 10 out of the 14 states and emerged as the front runner. This past week, one by one, Democratic candidates dropped out. Buttigieg, Klobuchar, Bloomberg, and Warren. All of them are out. So three Democratic candidates remain, but the serious battle for the nomination is between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. The next primary is March 10th, when seven more states will vote. Today we're going to talk about the aftermath of Super Tuesday and what's next. Here with me today is Vice President of Whitman Insight Strat Strategies, political and communication strategist Matt McDermott, and political analyst and professor of political science at Columbia University, Lincoln Mitchell. Thank you both for being here. Let's jump in. So we had a super boring Super Tuesday. <laughs> Not much happened. But 14 states, Joe Biden won 10. Bernie Sanders won four. Michael Bloomberg spent about $500 million to win American Samoa and gain about four delegates. Tulsi Gabbard's still hanging in there. Um, and then Elizabeth Warren came in third or fourth in every single state, not including Massachusetts and her home home state of Oklahoma. So that was a rough night for Elizabeth Warren. Let's take Warren first. No, let's take Bloomberg first, then Warren, and then we'll go to Bernie and Biden. Bloomberg, he spent a lot of money and the results didn't really come out the way he wanted. What do you think, Link? Bloomberg's candidacy is on some level absurd. He was never going to win the Democratic nomination for the simple reason that if your signature policy is stop and frisk and your battery of positions otherwise are essentially policies that really help rich people enjoy New York City more, which is a great extent what his mayoralty was about, you can't win a Democratic primary. However, he did accomplish something here. It's, it's a, if you look at the delegate count, he obviously embarrassed himself, but he took the estate tax off the table to spend half a billion dollars to take an estate tax, which is going to cost him two or three billion a year, actually is not, is not a bad investment. So, you know, and, and Bloomberg seems to now be committed genuinely to defeating Trump, but the Democratic Party has to really think about such a heavy dependence on one person. And especially with Sanders with this economic populism message, Bloomberg is a complete foil for that message. One last point about Bloomberg, though. Biden's big victory. Bloomberg had two roles in that. On the one hand, he came in, really could only win by sapping votes away from Biden. But in the last two debates, and in the campaign leading up to Super Tuesday, Biden was no longer the lightning rod for the attacks. He was no longer the old conservative right wing, which is not the right word, but that's what people were saying, Democrat in the room. Bloomberg became that. And Biden had a lot easier road because of that. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two ways to look at Mike Bloomberg exiting the race. I think on one hand, he has said all along uh, that he got in this race, one, to stop Donald Trump and two, to stop Bernie Sanders. And it's increasingly looked like he may, in fact, have stopped Bernie Sanders. Uh, on the flip side, uh, I think what we saw in this electorate, particularly on Super Tuesday, is we've seen a large set of voters who frankly don't care who the nominee is, so long as we focus our attention on Donald Trump. Uh, and I think because of the endorsement rollout that we've seen over the last week, uh, first with Jim Clyburn, then with Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, and now Mike Bloomberg, there's clearly a sense in the party that a large majority of this country wants to stop this primary and move on to the general election. I think that's what we saw on Super Tuesday with such a huge shift towards Joe Biden. And I think it's one of the reasons why Mike Bloomberg left this race so quickly is I think there's been a realization uh, that there is a coalescing around one candidate and that candidate was not Mike Bloomberg. Right. So, I mean, it seems like there are a lot of blue no matter who Democrats um, because in certain states we saw a decreased turnout. and. It's just, I don't really care who the Democratic right. nominee is. Let's just move forward. I also think it's pretty interesting because Bloomberg has infrastructure in quite a few states already, states that we'll see on March 10th and March 17th, that Biden will be the beneficiary of and not necessarily Bernie Sanders. So Bloomberg and his money are still in, Bloomberg's money in is the in the race. race. In some uh, sense. Bloomberg yeah. is not, but his money definitely is, which will obviously help the establishment candidate right. that everyone keeps calling Joe Biden. What do we do with Elizabeth Warren, and where do you think her supporters will go? Since lots of people assumed her supporters would go to Bernie Sanders, but it doesn't necessarily seem like that's the case. What do you think? So I have a bit of a unique take on Elizabeth Warren, I think, in which I hope at some point in the future 
our party looks back on this primary and thinks through the decisions we made and why we made them. Look, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious looking at the research and looking at the data uh, that there's a large percent of voters in this party that were afraid to nominate a woman against Donald Trump. Um, Even after Elizabeth Warren filleted Michael Bloomberg twice. Correct. Okay. Uh, Hillary Clinton pretty much beat Donald Trump once. Yes. Correct. Uh, and so I, I, I worry that we as a party learned the wrong lessons from 2016. Uh, and I think that had an effect on Kamala Harris. I think it had an effect on Kirsten Gillibrand. I think it had an effect on Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and I hope moving forward we look back at this primary and think through why we made those decisions and moving forward don't make the same ones. Because I, I think it's a mistake for us to think that we need to put an old white man against Donald Trump. Ultimately, that's what we're set to do, and that's that's fine. I think we'll mobilize around that ultimate nominee, um, but I worry we're doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. I would just say a couple things. First of all, look, I hope to be an old white man someday, but one of the real lessons we've seen here is the hubris of these old white guys. Yeah. If you look at Sanders on the left of the party and Biden in the center of the party, these are the last two guys standing. This would be so Don't much... Read Tulsi Gabbard. We'll these are the last two guys second. standing. Don't... Don't... This would be so much of a better race for the Democratic Party and for the country if it were Warren on the left of the party and Harris in the center, or Hickenlooper, or Klobuchar. These two, they had enormous name recognition. They, they allowed them to pull ahead. And frankly, Biden right now is almost certain to be the nominee. There is a case for Biden's electability, but he also is a very flawed candidate. If one of the other centrists, Kamala Harris, who in my view was very unfortunate she dropped out as early as she did, but if Kamala Harris were that candidate, or Amy Klobuchar, or even one of the guys like John Hickenlooper or Michael Bennett, we'd be spending a lot less time discussing the inevitable gaffes, which will be coming pretty regularly, discussing Hunter Biden, et cetera. So this is a real, this is a real problem. The, the other thing I would say is that this notion that we can't elect a woman, in my view, is nonsensical, and it has kind of sexist origins. But I was struck, as, as a Jew, that we never discussed, can we elect a Jew? It seems pretty clear to me that there's some real obstacles there, right? That we, we are living in a time in a rise of anti-Semitism domestically and internationally, and that issue didn't get discussed at all. And I'm not saying we should have discussed it as a way to push Sanders out of the race, but it would have been an interesting time to have a discussion about that. And if Especially we're going to, also when Michael Bloomberg right, was in the right. race. Right, and, and in, the last, in the last debate, they asked Sanders what I thought was, a, frankly, a very anti-Semitic question, which came down to, you're a Jew, not all Jews, you're not as hawkish on Israel as, as right. most Jews, which isn't even true. And instead of saying, you're a Jew, what are the obstacles about electability? Right. But I think we selectively pick on, on some criteria, not others. The truth is every president, with the exception of one, has been a white man. As recently as 1996, the Democrats nominated a white man who won, right? This notion that the Democrats win when they elect white men is a, is a theory in search of data. Right. Wow. Well, I mean, I think that that is a really fascinating point because I, I thought when Bloomberg was in the race, I asked the question, why are we not talking about anti-Semitism? Because we knew that Trump would try and frame it in the way that he, he definitely does, especially with his kind of George Soros uh, fixation. If I may, we don't know how to talk about anti-Semitism in this country, right? It is anti-Semitism is a distinct problem on the left and on the right, and it presents itself similarly often. And um, for many, many Americans, particularly on the right, Anti-Semitism is, there, there is an overlap between anti-Semitism and anti-Israel, but it's not the same. So we have a Likudnik president, and that gives him cover. And at the same time, he has played on some of the most oldest and vicious anti-Semitic tropes since he started running for president. But the problem is, the leading Jewish candidate in this race dances with those tropes also. Yes. Right? And that's a problem. When you start talking about conspiracies and unseen forces, there are people who read that a certain way. Now, Bernie Sanders is by no measure an anti-Semite, and I don't want to suggest that, but it complicated it because of the way he spoke about it. But I would also add this. Many people I spoke to say, you know, if you call Elizabeth Warren shrill or Hillary Clinton shrill, that's sexist. And you know what? It is. But if you have a problem with the way Bernie Sanders waves his hand and talks loudly, you might want to think about your own implicit bias. Well, I think let's get to Bernie because, you know, there's so many. I was talking to my students about this, and they initially liked Warren but they didn't like her compromises with Medicare for All and sort of how she was slowly but surely moving a, a touch to the center. And they put all their eggs in the Bernie basket. And now, if, if our assumptions are correct and Joe Biden gets the nomination, because you didn't want a compromise candidate, you now get nothing, right? Correct. You now get or Joe Biden. Little, or very little, right? I mean, you're not going to get a, a Trump candidate. But, you know, there's so many people who don't understand the art of compromise when it comes to politics. I mean, that is the or foundation the of, of our politics democracy. foundationally to begin with, yeah. Right. And so, with a candidate like Bernie Sanders, who seems a little calcified in some of his ideologies, where does that leave 
sort of his supporters, um, let's just say if he doesn't get the nomination, because at least the way it's been reported, his supporters, many of them seem like Bernie or Bust supporters. Right. Do we think that they would actually go over to Biden? And more importantly, will Bernie Sanders encourage them to go over to Biden if Biden's the nominee? I think so. I mean, to step back and sort of look at Bernie Sanders in this race right now, I think his challenge is one of coalition building, which is ironic thinking about Bernie Sanders. But what perplexes me about the Sanders campaign is no one on that campaign took a look at 2016 and said, how do we win over any of the 55 percent of this country that voted for Hillary Clinton? And so they're left in a position now where they have a smaller plurality than they did in 2016 and no ability to win over people that didn't support him in 2016. That is a fundamental flaw in running a presidential campaign. And I think the question for them over the next few weeks as they think through whether they have a path to the nomination is how can they win over voters who either voted for him in 2016 because they didn't like Hillary Clinton or who have never really liked him but consider a progressive challenger important uh, and make inroads with that community. I frankly don't know how they do that because they haven't over the last four years, and I think that's where his challenge in this primary lies right now. So I wanna, I wanna stick with you for yeah. a second because looking at the data, Bernie Sanders actually came Has in he lost some of the percentage points in right. certain states that he did really well in in 2016. And so, you know, as a consultant, you know, it seems as though he hasn't spent these past four years making outreach to the black community in a significant, substantial way, which we know is the base of the Democratic Party. So what's the strategy there? How does he see a path to victory if he's not actively courting the base? And you not know, thinking of him skipping Mississippi and going and spending time in Michigan instead. Altogether. Uh, and I think his challenge is, is actually even bigger than that. Not only has he not made any inroads with black voters, he's lost significant support among white working class voters, which would suggest that a significant number of white working class voters voted for Bernie Sanders in 2016 because they didn't like Hillary Clinton. I think we can draw implications as to why that is, um, but they wanted a white man as the ticket for the Democratic Party, and now they see that in Joe Biden, um, which is why I think Joe Biden has made inroads with communities that Sanders was strong in. In the meantime, Sanders didn't build out any sort of coalition beyond who he had in 2016. And so you see his numbers among black voters, uh, not only as bad as they are in 2016, but frankly among older black voters in the South, uh, non-existent support. I mean, Joe Biden won margins among older black voters, 60, 70, 80% of the vote. And it looks like he may come away in Mississippi next week with the black. entire delegate majority yeah. out of that state. Uh, meanwhile, Bernie Sanders is sort of trenching himself back in, in northern states where there are more white voters. Um, so, I, I mean, I think his challenge is twofold. One, he hasn't gone out and won support uh, among the base of voters he needs. Uh, and two, he's losing support among people who didn't vote for Hillary Clinton in 2016 for some reason or another. Uh, and now we're voting for Joe Biden, uh, who politically, very similar to Hillary Clinton, uh, obvious difference being he's a white man. Uh, and so I, I think there are reasons why those voters have come home to uh, a person like Joe Biden. And just as a reminder to our to our viewers, the delegate count, it's not like the Electoral College. It's not a winner take all. Correct. So there is this proportional allocation. So the fact that Joe Biden could could potentially take away all of Mississippi is a big deal. And that's what's important. I, I you know, we've talked about this uh, a little bit in the past, but essentially it's, it's not just who wins a state, but the margin by which they win a state. And so you can have a person like Joe Biden get a bigger delegate majority out of Mississippi where he wins by 40 points than Bernie Sanders say if he won Michigan next week by two or three points. Uh, and so those landslide victories matter in a delegate race like this. Let me just push back on one thing that's very important, and this is my West Coast bias, but when we say Bernie hasn't increased his, his coalition, he absolutely did. He changed the game with Latinos, particularly in the western half of this country, right? Nevada, he won with Latinos. California, he won with Latinos. He almost won Texas on the Latino vote. So he did real work there, and he did a, and he accomplished a lot. He didn't do similar work in African American communities, particularly in the South. Going into Super Tuesday, he was running strong with younger African-American voters, and that was going to balance out some of Biden's obvious strength with older African-American okay. voters. The state of the race now changed that. But I think there's another problem fundamentally baked into Sanders' theory of the campaign that, that hurt him in 2016 and hurt him in 2020, which is this. He built his campaign on two pillars. One is progressive left of center economic policies. And the truth is the people that, that want that are much, it's a much higher number 
than the kind of punditry would, would let you think. Most people do want some form of, of radical improvement to our health care. Most people do want some form of changing the tax system, of funding education differently. There's a real constituency from that across every demographic. But the other pillar is his war on the democratic establishment. And that's, as you said, because implied, it's because he's stuck in 1950 or 60 where he's fighting against, you know, Dick Daly and Meet Esposito or something. And, and that's not the way the democratic establishment works now. What Donald Trump has done, among other, many other things, is he has reinvigorated support for rank and file Democrats for the Democratic establishment. So, for example, Nancy Pelosi, who is the, the, the epitome of the Democratic establishment, is a beloved figure, Adam Schiff, in this town, Jerry Nadler and Hakeem Jeffries, you can't run against them. Uh, Bernie carried San Francisco, which is Pelosi's district, but Pelosi beat her left-wing Democratic primary challenger six to one there. If he had ratcheted down the fight against the establishment and stuck to the simple truths about economics that he speaks in simple language, he would have done a lot better. But this Democratic primary electorate, they don't want to go to the war with who the Obamas. That's right. not the fight they want. They want to take the fight to Trump. It's also, I mean, it's a misunderstanding of the Democratic electorate. We as Democrats believe in building things up. We do not believe in tearing things down. It's been a truism of this party for decades. And a candidate like Bernie Sanders does not believe in that vision. Now, he has a different approach for, I think, getting a lot of the same policy objectives done. Uh, and I think it's a debate worth having. But I think that's why you've seen, particularly among black voters in the South, why he has struggled to win over supporters, because they see him as the antithesis to the work they've done over decades right. of building up not only their communities, but this party to stand for them. And this country, right? Yes. Because keep in mind, you know, I always tell people, my mother just turned 72. She's never gone to school with white people a day in her life. She's only gone to segregated schools, and that was sanctioned by the U.S. government. Yep. So when we talk about what this country used to be, it's actually not that that far in the past. So a Bernie Sanders candidacy is, in some, in some ways, talking to Southern voters, insulting because of the work that has been done. But I, I want to just pivot just a little bit before we run out of time, because we're talking about two septuagenarians who have unique visions of what this country was and what this country is and what it should be. But now more than ever, it seems like the vice president that they choose will be a very important figure. Bernie Sanders is 78 and a half years old. Uh, if he wins in November, he'll be 79. Both of them are the oldest, you know, if they win, they'll be the oldest presidents we've ever seen. Uh, general life expectancy of men, even of their stature and their health insurance benefits. We're, we're on a, the, the, as my dad says, we're in the fourth quarter. So who should they choose and who could they choose to really strategically galvanize Democrats to come out and feel comfortable with two soon to be octogenarians in the White House. I'll start with you, Lincoln. Let's start with Biden. Who should Biden really think about um, to sort of make his candidacy uh, exciting for Democrats should he win the nomination? Biden should find an old white conservative guy. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> there's two ways to think about this. One is balancing the ticket demographically, and one is balancing the ticket ideologically. Uh -huh. And what I'm seeing is that the strength he showed with African-American voters suggests that maybe he needs to think ideologically rather than demographically. So for example, a Kamala Harris, who is a centrist, but an African-American woman, brings a lot of demographic and geographic balance uh -huh. to it, not that you have to worry about California, right. right? But I would suggest somebody else here, which is a bit of a wild card. I'm gonna suggest Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Warren makes it very hard for the hardline Bernies. Some of them are going to stay home, but that, what that says is within two, three years, we're going to have a really progressive president. And certainly, if after one term, we very well may be running a very progressive candidate. So I would think ideologically, and I think Elizabeth Warren has shown herself to be, among other things, smart, hardworking, progressive, a woman of integrity, dedicated. And watching her debate Mike Pence would be just, you think, you think she gave Mike Bloomberg a hard time? Yeah, that would be chef's kiss. It'd be fantastic. Beautiful. Now, and do you think that that's probably, I mean, granted, she just stepped out of the race on Thursday. Um, is that possibly one of the reasons why we haven't heard, as of yet, her um, uh, uh, endorse anyone? I mean, the, the, the challenge that Warren faces right now is that, is that I think we, we've danced up to this in this discussion, but Joe Biden's going to be the nominee. This is not really a two-person race anymore. Joe Biden, I mean, unless he just, you know, there's no, and if he stumbles, people still may not go to Bernie. So he's almost certain to be the nominee. Therefore, for her, endorsing Sanders gets her nowhere, but she has to do that gracefully. So my sense is she has to end up with Biden, 
but she may, she may be better for everybody, including Joe Biden, if she takes a little time. So it's not seen as an establishment rush to Biden, but it's a more well thought out position. I don't actually disagree that much. I, I think obviously Senator Warren would be a great candidate uh, as vice president. I, I do think a uh, uh, Biden nominee has to give a nod to what got us to this place. And you look back at 2018 and the wave we had in that midterm election, and you saw candidates like Sharice Davids, a younger Native American lesbian win in Kansas. You saw Angie Craig, similarly a lesbian woman, win in a very rural and conservative district in Minnesota. You saw Katie Porter win in a Republican district in Orange County that hadn't gone to a Democrat since California was a state. Um, and so I, I think that alone suggests that there is not only an important role for a woman on the ticket, but I think looking forward, we all recognize that Joe Biden is not the future of this party. Uh, he might be the next president. Uh, and I, I think so long as he's the nominee, we will all rally behind him as the nominee. But he's not the future of this country in any way. And so I think the vice president in that sort of role plays a very important role. Uh, way in which the party can give a nod to the future of who we want to be as a party, what ideological positions we want to take, and who the president to come after a Biden presidency looks like. Um, and so for all those reasons, I think it needs to be uh, someone who's younger. I think it needs to be a progressive, and I think it needs to be a woman. And frankly, I think it needs to be a woman of color, given the fact that uh, Biden's candidacy very much has been fueled by those very same voters. So what if, let's just, you know, I, I love to, to play sort of fan fiction with democratic <laughs> politics. I always think, like, what if Gary Hart hadn't been caught on the, the boat called the monkey business, right? What if Dukakis hadn't gotten in that tank and looked like a child? I mean, these are all fun games to play. But just in case Bernie Sanders does become the Democratic nominee, who should he think about as his running mate? Bernie Sanders has to go with a woman of color in this. I mean, I think he has no choice. The, the most qualified is Kamala Harris, but I think Harris creates a problem for him because his left-wing base in California really doesn't like Kamala Harris, frankly, for all the wrong, stupid reasons, in my view, but she's really unpopular there. So that actually is not a great move for, for him. Stacey Abrams is an obvious one. Um, I, I know Stacey Abrams' work. I haven't seen her that much. And, you know, a state legislature to President of the United States in a few years is a jump. I assume she's ready for that, but they, want to, they would make, need to make very, very sure that she is. If, you know, Tammy Duckworth would, would, be, would be a fine nominee. So I think with him, it, but, but I would say with him, an African-American woman, Val Demings, somebody, is, is the way he would have to, to think. Val but Val Demings is but, a former police officer and but, which, a which little moderate. Yeah. Ticket. The problem with Sanders is he has demonstrated, as you suggested earlier in this discussion, a just, just almost principled inability to think strategically. Right. So, you know, he, he might find some, you know, Ro Connor or somebody, I mean, some kind of right. lefty congressperson who's not really going to bring anything to the ticket but just doubles down on the radicalism, which would be a mistake. Right. So I guess I take a bit of a different take. I mean, I, I think... If Sanders were the nominee, his path to the presidency is very different than a Joe Biden path. I think Biden's path runs through places like Arizona, maybe Georgia, North Carolina, maybe Florida is still on the map. Uh, a Sanders presidency runs through Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and maybe Ohio, Pennsylvania. Uh, it runs through the upper Midwest. It's the only way he would win this presidency. And so my guess is if he were the nominee, uh, the vice president has to come from somewhere in that region. I think it still needs to be a woman. I think someone like Tammy Baldwin would make a lot of sense. Wisconsin, Wisconsin progressive senator who's won in landslides every election, uh, is herself a lesbian woman. Uh, I think that itself puts a historic nod on the candidacy. Uh, and I think helps him out in places that he frankly has to win, um, places where I think Joe Biden uh, runs probably a bit stronger right now. And I think also Joe Biden's uh, path to the presidency runs probably through the Sun Belt. We want to also note that in the Sun Belt, Sanders has some strength because of the Latino vote. Sanders can win Arizona with, with Latino votes, and he probably would do better than, uh, than, than Biden there. In the, in the Midwest, the upper Midwest, which I think an, any candidate has to win, the African-American vote is important. You can't win Michigan without big African-American turnout, with Milwaukee and Wisconsin, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. So he's got to kind of thread that needle. He's got to be, almost trust his own ability to bring right. those voters out and add to it right. with, with a person of color. And we saw suppressed African-American turnout in Wisconsin and Michigan in 2016, hence yeah. the results that, right, right. that we received as Democrats. So let's look forward to March 10th. We've got Mississippi, Michigan, Missouri, Washington, which in many ways is the epicenter of the coronavirus, and Bernie Sanders has been endorsed by Marion Williamson, who doesn't believe in vaccinations. Um, 
you know, we've got Idaho. I mean, what are you all looking for on March 10th for Biden and Bernie? Michigan. I mean, if Bernie Sanders cannot win Michigan, and it looks increasingly unlikely, to me, for all intents and purposes, I, I don't see how he picks up the delegates to win moving forward. I mean, he is set to lose Florida in a landslide. Uh, and the remaining states out there look a lot like Michigan in terms of delegate halls. You've got Illinois, which demographically is very much like Michigan. You've got New York, which Bernie Sanders lost by 12 points in 2016. There is no other, you've got Pennsylvania a month later, there is no other state out there that Bernie Sanders can pull a delegate hall if he can't win a place like Michigan. Uh, so I think that is the state we should be watching on Tuesday and barring some change from a Biden win there, it's very hard to see how Joe Biden is not the Democratic nominee. Really briefly. Even if he wins, even, I'm looking for a landslide win in Michigan to keep this thing alive for Sanders. Otherwise, it's over. If he wins Michigan narrowly, it's still over because March 10th is tough for him. March 17th is much tougher for him. Right. Thank you all so much. That's all the time we have. Matt McDermott and Lincoln Mitchell, thank you so much for your thoughts. And thank you for watching the special edition of Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm Christina Greer. Goodbye. Goodbye.